you're live. I can't see it. Okay, so it's uh, okay. All right. A good uh, morning, and uh, everyone. Uh, for those who are in uh, in the east west coast of Canada, those who are on the east coast good, and uh, Europe, good good afternoon. So it's a great pleasure uh, for us to uh, to host uh, uh, Professor Derek Rosenzweig uh, uh, from uh, McGill University with us today. Uh, he will be talking about 3D bioprinting for biomedical applications. Uh, before we start the talk. Uh, 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 I would like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please make sure that uh, you ask your questions uh, using uh, the ask a question box. Uh, also, there is a poll uh, available uh, to you. Uh, please participate in the poll and share your thoughts with uh, with uh, with us. Uh, uh, you can always email me and, and Human uh, if you have any uh, concerns, any suggestions and for any feedback about these e seminar series. Uh, also, I would like to announce that our next speaker is Professor Mehdi Nikha uh, from Arizona State University, uh, who uh, will be uh, joining us next week. And we'll be talking about uh, personalized diagnostics and the applications of uh, tissue engineering in, in the area of uh, 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 personalized medicine. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank our sponsor, Montreal Transmed Tech Institute, who has been uh, with us since almost the beginning of these e-seminar series. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Rosenzweig. Uh, Dr. Rosenzweig received his uh, PhD in molecular and cellular uh, uh, pharmacology from University of Miami uh, School of Medicine in 2008. He completed three postdoctoral fellowships between the University of Miami and McGill University in Montreal on heart valve uh, degeneration, cartilage tissue engineering, and um, intervertebral uh, disc repair and regeneration. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at McGill University and uh, the scientist at the Research Institute of McGill University Health Center in Injury Repair and Recovery Program. He has a background in stem cell and musculoskeletal cell biology, as well as biomaterials, hydrogels, and 3D bioprinting. His lab focuses on leveraging biofabrication technology to study musculoskeletal repair and regeneration, as well as building human tissue uh, uh, and tumor models for therapeutic screening and uh, development. With that, I would like to thank uh, uh, our uh, speaker for accepting our invitation. It's a great pleasure to have you with us, Derek. And the virtual floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Homan and uh, Mozen. This is a very uh, wonderful uh, seminar series you guys have been running. I've watched several of the uh, videos uh, after you posted them online, and it's, uh, it's a really nice job you guys are doing. And thanks very much to TransMedTech as well. Uh, for you guys to invite me to be here today. Okay, let's share that screen. Do that. Everybody can see it. It's in the full mode. Excellent. Okay, so so uh, uh, like uh, Mozen just introduced, I'll be talking to you all today about uh, what we're really up to here in my lab, and that's leveraging 3D printing and bioprinting technologies for biomedical applications. So just before we get into that, I like to. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing this. I've seen it done before, and I think it's kind of cool. So I'll just give you guys my, my brief academic journey. So some people may know that or may not, not know that, but I'm actually born in Toronto. And when I was uh, nine, my family moved to uh, Florida, South Florida, in the Broward County region. And I did all of my university uh, and uh, doctoral training there. So between Florida Atlantic University and University of Miami. Uh, after doing a postdoc there, I had met my soon-to-be wife, and uh, due to family reasons, actually, uh, we had to move back to Montreal, where she was from, uh, at which point I took up a, a postdoctoral position with uh, Tom Quinn in chemical engineering at McGill, and then moved to the Department of Surgery uh, to work with Elizabeth Hagland in, in 2013 with the Spine Group, and I've been with the Spine Group ever since. So that's my brief academic journey, which I thought is kind of cool to show. Okay, 
So before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about bone metastases and specifically uh, spine metastases because this is the major focus of, of my lab. Uh, and uh, so I just wanted to go into the problem of spine metastases. So they occur secondary to other tumor types such as breast, lung, kidney, and prostate are the main ones that usually end up metastasizing to the bone. And out of all the bones that these types of tumors can metastasize to, it's most frequently associated with spine mets. Uh, okay, and what these met metastatic lesions end up causing is significant pain in the patients as well as instability in the spine. And what that means is that it, they, these patients end up getting fractures and, and nerve pinching on the nerve root, which brings, brings them into the uh, operating room for emergency surgeries often. So the current treatment strategies for these patients uh, is surgical resection and uh, systemic chemotherapy and anti-resorptive therapy, and those usually in the form of bisphosphonates. So the problems with, with these two uh, treatment strategies right now is that surgical resection can leave critical size bone defects, which is uh, sort of overly represented here in this image. Uh, and and what, what often happens is it leaves behind residual tumor that cannot be completely removed, and the patients will end up getting recurrence after this is repaired with, with the bone cement, uh, and, and they end up getting destabilizations again. And, and the, the problem is, is that they actually live quite a long time with these Mets, and they end up coming to the hospital multiple times, which is not good for the patient. Uh, the problems with the systemic chemotherapy and anti-resorptive therapy is that they have low site-specific efficacy, meaning that the drugs don't get too well right to these sites in, in the spine where they're needed. Uh, there's also several side effects associated with systemic uh, therapy, and there's a lack of patient specificity. What does that mean? It means that everybody's cancer is a little bit different. It's a very heterogeneous disease. It's a, it's a group of different diseases, and, and because the origin can be from different types and subtypes of cancers, it makes it very difficult to, to have a one, a one drug that fits all type model. So the approach that we take to handle this, uh, really these, these, these large bone defects and, and inability to get drugs to the site is we use an additive manufacturing approach. So what's additive manufacturing? Uh, the most common word for it is 3D printing. Uh, and and what, what is 3D printing used for? It's, build, it, it's building models from a computer model into a physical model using a layer by layer uh, method. Okay, it's very cost effective to produce unique geometries. And those unique geometries are important features of 3D printing because they can't be produced with uh, classic uh, subtractive manufacturing, uh, which uses milling and machining. Okay, so the other thing that's very good about this is you can design uh, implantable devices uh, on a patient specific manner. Um, for orthopedic applications, 3D printed scaffolds could be used to guide bone repair. They can be fabricated using different materials, polymers, uh, ceramics, metals. Uh, these are the common things that are being used. And really what's the most common thing that's being used, uh, the 3D printing is used for it in, in the surgical and orthopedic field right now is pre-surgical planning. So that's the main use for it right now. So what is 3D printing and, and why, why do we use it? Like I said, we go from a computer design model Right, that we can draw. We can draw in a 3D software. Uh, it can be from a scan. It, it can be. It can be designed from scratch in the software. And then that that model that you create has to be converted into a code, a code that the 3D printer understands. And that's done with a slicing software. And what it does is it breaks the model into the individual layers that uh, will be then printed by the printer. And of course, finally, you need a, a physical printer that you can input that information into and the printer will go ahead and execute all the commands set in the code and you end up with your final object. So this is just a, a little overview of the different types of 3D printing. There's binder jetting, uh, there's laser assisted printing, there's fused deposition modeling. Uh, again, there's, there's, a, there's a laser sintering, different types of laser sintering, there's, there's photo curing, uh, and, and obviously at the very end here, what we're interested in as well as, well as the bioprinting, where you have live cells as you're in, in, in a gel-like material, which serves as your ink. Okay, so what I like to do often in, in these lectures is give uh, a brief history of 3D printing, because uh, a lot of people find that, that they don't really know too much about the origins of it. So the question that I give you all is really, how, how new is it? And I usually 
poll the audience, and I don't, I don't think I have the ability to do that here, but we asked the question, how, how new is it? A lot of people think 3D printing is pretty new, like in the last 10, 15 years. But really, the idea for 3D printing emerged in 1974 by David Jones. Uh, he's a, an author for New Scientist. And he came out with a lot of ideas for, for, for things that were actually uh, eventually realized in the future. So, so he first laid out the idea of 3D printing, the concept of it. Um, and, and then out of Japan, there was the first, uh, the first 3D printer was actually designed, but uh, there was no funds for research and development and uh, a patent couldn't be issued. Same thing happened in 1984 for a French engineer had a uh, great idea, mapped out a plan for a 3D printer, but um, the, the employer uh, did not want to go through with the patent on this. So it wasn't until Chuck Hull came along 1984 uh, and patented the first stereolithography 3D printer. And his major contribution is the STL file, which many of us uh, use today. So he formed also the company uh, 3D Systems. Uh, in 1988, uh, Scott Crump was a mechanical engineer came up with the idea by using a hot glue gun for fused deposition modeling, which is which is really the type of 3D printer that most of us have sitting on our desks. It's a plastic printer. So, uh, so it's, it's been around, 3D printing has been around for quite some time, actually. Um, in 2005, at the University of Bath in England, uh, the RepRap movement started. And the idea behind the RepRap movement was to have a sort of uh, manufacturing uh, revolution where, where everybody could have open source 3D printers uh, that would, would create this sort of industrial revolution where we could all be making our own things all the time. Uh, and and their, their claim to fame was the printer that printed all the parts for the, for the offspring printer. So interestingly, I don't know if many of you know this, but this group of people here, this is Brie Pettis, uh, Adam Mayer, and uh, Zach Smith, they actually spent time over there learning about the RepRap project. And, and they came up with the idea of bringing uh, like uh, 3D printing to the average person so that all of us could have this in our homes and all of us could have this sitting uh, on, our, on our desks uh, to help us create and make things. And, and they started the company MakerBot. And they actually had the crazy idea that they could, they could put a dent in the market and sort of overtake uh, commercial 3D printing that was going on at the time. And they presented their, their uh, Thingomatic replicator uh, that you could purchase for uh, you know a couple thousand bucks. You could get this with two print heads and you could order it. And it really took off from there in 2009. Uh, so, so by 2012, they were really on the, on the map. And uh, if any of you are interested um, uh, on Netflix, there's a movie called Print the Legend. It's a documentary about uh, mostly about uh, this group, MakerBot, as well as a couple of other companies that came up at that time. Uh, but they were really all about open source. And the controversy was that at some point, these guys from MakerBot sold out to Chuck Hall for, for a lot of money. So, so that's interesting. And what ends up happening with the, when, the, when the 3D printing became available for everybody is you find printers that you can purchase for very low cost on Amazon. Anybody can get into this for a couple hundred bucks. And, and, and some places have these print farms like you see here. So it's really caught on a lot in the last 10 years. So coming back to our focus, what do we do with this, with this technology? Well, we, we, we use two types of the 3D printing technology. Like I said, this is just a flash forge uh, that we have in the lab here. And that's our, that's our thermoplastic printer for, for plastic polymer printing. And then we have a BioX as well as another uh, smaller printer that we use for our bioprinting and that uses hydrogels and cells as our print materials. So what do we do with those? Well, we take this approach to build human tissue models and those models can be used for drug screening. And then perhaps we use them in other cases for uh, regenerative medicine type applications. So that's the main purpose of taking this approach. And like I said, it builds back into that uh, bone metastasis that we're quite interested in. And it's, it's actually spun into a few other areas that we're interested in as well, which I'll touch on at the end. Okay, so what, what really got me into this 3D printing was this first study I, I was involved in. Uh, it was published in, in 2015, but we actually started working on it back in, in the end of 2013. And this really got me into it. We, we, we had a, a desktop 3D printer lying around and we asked, can we use this uh, thermoplastic printer for doing some very simplistic tissue engineering applications? And it turned out that we could very nicely demonstrate that ABS plastic, which is not a biocompatible 
type of plastic. Uh, it's, it's from a petroleum source, but the ABS plastic and the PLA plastics could be used to build little scaffolds to actually model cartilage and nucleus pulposus, which is a type of uh, spinal disc tissue for tissue repair applications. And it could be used to model tissue, uh, which could be then applied for, for repair models. It could be applied for, applied for drug screening and things like that. And, and it was a very simplistic idea and it really took off nicely. So we were able to show that you can you can do this type of work using very, very basic materials and, and very basic printers. Uh, and and we sh the, the nice thing that we were able to show is that when we grew uh, isolated chondrocytes from the cartilage or isolated uh, NP cells from the NP tissue, they, re they retained their identity and they behaved as though they were supposed to behave and, and produced the correct ratio of proteins, which are mainly uh, the proteoglycans and collagen two networks. So it, it turned out really nice. Uh, another, at that time, other papers were coming out from Dietmar Huttbacher's group, which really uh, caught my interest. And that's that was where they were taking, uh, this is an, out of Australia, they were taking polycaprolactone uh, 3D printed constructs that fit perfectly into the, the leg of the animal where they created a, a critical size defect, which wouldn't heal on its own. And they filled that 3D printed structure with a with a bone morphogenic protein, and they were able to show after uh, so many months that that animal had a complete healing of the bone of that critical size defect. And if you ever get to see a talk from Dietmar Huttmacher, it's a really nice. He shows a video of the animal then running around uh, several months later after this surgery, which is quite remarkable. Uh, take that a step further out of Australia. What really caught my interest then at the time as well was the idea of using these types of approaches to actually repair bone defects in humans. So there's a, there was a, a man in Australia that had uh, a nasty infection. Ruben Lichter is his name. He had a nasty bone infection in his tibia. And he had two options from the, the, the uh, surgical staff there. Either have your leg amputated or try a, a new uh, experimental approach to use 3D printing to repair the bone in your leg. So he agreed to take this, and they actually put a long piece of, of PCL that was printed to be form-fitting exactly to the piece of bone that needed to be replaced. And you can see here in the surgical model that they actually put it in over this metal rod for stabilization. And that was back in 2017. There was a follow-up story that came out of the news. By 2019, he's able to walk around on this leg uh, without any assistance. So I find that fascinating, and I think that's a spectacular way of showing the possibilities of what 3D printing can do. Okay, again, just want to remind everybody what we're doing. We're taking this approach to come up with uh, ways to test, you know, therapeutic delivery devices by building human tissues. Uh, we're also using this to model uh, soft tissue uh, repair and regeneration applications or model the soft tissue itself, like for example, ligaments and tendons uh, in, uh, interfacing with bone-like tissues. Uh, we're using this to study osteochondral interface and, and therapeutic screening potentials. And, and most importantly, and this is the biggest area of our lab right now, is we're using this to screen uh, local therapeutic delivery devices for, for anti-tumor effects. And we, we basically use the bioprinting for this to make a tumor on a chip model where we can grow different types of patient-derived cancer cells in, in very spatially uh, designed areas of the model, and then we can actually build in uh, stroma to this to represent the microenvironment of the tumor. And then we can measure outgrowth of the tumor. We can measure uh, the, the multicellular spheroid formations under different types of treatments. Okay, and, and then finally, the last thing that we're interested in, uh, which we've done quite a bit of work on, but uh, not so much these days, is, is using these types of uh, thermoplastics for uh, bone repair applications. Okay, so that's just in a nutshell all, all the different things that we're that we're interested in. Uh, so let's get into the first part of this talk, which I'm going to focus on is our, our, our thermoplastic polymeric printing for tissue repair and, and drug delivery. Uh, so so this is a nice uh, image that uh, a student in the lab came up with for one of our papers, and it really shows the different types of things we're doing with 3D printing. Uh, so with the bioprinter, you can do several things. We can have thermoplastic print heads. We can have hydrogels with cells. And there's different types of uh, printing we can do with this. So we can control pore sizes, uh, which could have some kind of physical uh, effect on stem cell differentiation. 
We can use thermoplastics that have bioactive uh, additives such as uh, calcium phosphates, ceramics that will also have an impact, a biological or biochemical impact on uh, stem cell differentiation. And then you can also do co-printing of these plastic thermoplastics as a support structure and then and then lay uh, you know interpenetrating gel network with with high, uh, with uh, cells in it as well to have these composite structures. So we're working towards this and this is where we've actually done quite a bit of work so far. So variable pore sizes. This is a study that uh, in collaboration with Elizabeth Hagland and, and one of her former PhD students where we asked, can we change the pore size and manipulate uh, uh, cell differentiation and matrix uh, production? So we compared osteoblasts, primary human osteoblasts on these structures, and then looked for which, uh, which pore size would influence the calcified matrix deposition in a positive way. Uh, and then we followed that up with once we identified that, uh, that optimal pore size, then we follow that up with what would be the influence of this on uh, bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cell differentiation towards osteoblasts. Uh, so what we found was uh, that uh, we could we could very reproducibly generate these uh, these different pore sizes, which is important because inexpensive uh, desktop 3D printers, you might think they might not be that accurate, but what we found is, they're, they're quite accurate. And this was done on a, on a, on a Flash Forge Creator Pro. Um, we were able to come with with a, with a elastic modulus or, or a compressive modulus that is approaching uh, that of trabecular bone. So this this uh, structure that has the most material in it with the smaller pore size is around uh, has having a compressive modulus between five to ten percent strain of 200 megapascals, which is getting close to trabecular bone. So we're, we're happy with that. And then what we found is when we cultured those uh, primary human osteoblasts on them, the, the medium sized pore, which has 750 micron pore sizes, consistently had the most calcified matrix identified by Alizar and red staining. Uh, and, and then when we did some uh, Western blot analysis of the protein we isolated from here, we just chose to use osteopontin as a, as a bone matrix marker, or there's many others. But again, the, the medium-sized pore uh, generated the most of this bone protein. So we, we identified that as an optimal uh, pore size for osteoblasts to grow on and generate bone-like matrix. We then went ahead and took the stem cells uh, put them in osteogenic media and showed that in all three cases, the stem cells could uh, differentiate and produce a calcified matrix identified by the Alizar and red staining. And the SEM images confirmed that we have a lot of extracellular matrix formation. This is the acellular, this is uh, osteoblasts, and this is the osteogenically differentiated mesenchymal stem cells. We get a lot of uh, collagen network building up in between those pores. So the next thing that we did with that is we went ahead and tried some material uh, that we got from a company in collaboration with a company, Polymed Inc., that's out of South Carolina, uh, that's developing medical grade polymers with and without uh, beta tricalcium phosphate, which is a bone mineral. And we did very similar tests. And in fact, we found out here that, that their materials, this is a pure lactide and this is a lactide with uh, tricalcium phosphate, actually gave us a better compressive uh, modulus in that same range, uh, even closer to trabecular bone, which is between 350 to 400. And they gave us another material, which was had, had a little bit more elasticity to it. It was a more of a composite material with and without beta TCP. And we chose in our study to move forward with this 100M uh, material, which better represented the uh, uh, mechanical properties of trabecular bone. We went ahead and put uh, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells on, on these samples and culture them uh, in standard culture media or osteogenic media for, I think it was 21 or 28 days. And uh, what you could see here clearly is that the material with beta TCP, even in standard culture media, drove those cells to undergo some type of osteogenic differentiation and lay down calcified matrix compared to the acellular control. Uh, of course, that was enhanced once we put them in the osteogenic media uh, and, and we went ahead and quantified that. So, so the beta TCP in osteogenic media really had a significant amount of, uh, of, of Alizar and the red S stain coming here. Uh, and, and that looked good for us to move forward in, in an in vivo um, bone defect model. So we went ahead and created a bone defect model. Now, this was just a trial for safety. 
uh, and we weren't trying to uh, close a critical size defect. We just wanted to prove that these materials could be implanted in vivo, not cause uh, a foreign body effect and have some potential to repair the bone. So you can see this one was removed after six weeks and, and the, the scaffold is there inside the, the defect. And that's just putting the, the defect, there's the scaffold and a suture was just put around it to sort of hold it in place because it was only push fit. After six weeks, we saw a very nice uh, integration of the bone into the pore, open pore spaces of those scaffolds. Uh, and, and so we had six animals that had the beta TCP and six animals that had just the 100M material with no beta TCP. And interestingly, of the six animals that had no beta TCP, half of them got a, a fracture. Uh, when we quantified by micro CT, the, these regions of interest for, for bone to tissue volume ratios, uh, we saw a significant improvement uh, in the bone to tissue volume ratio when uh, when we had the beta TCP there. So this was all looking great. And we just recently published this uh, work again. This was in collaboration with, with Elizabeth Hagland, and it was a really nice story. So I just wanted to quickly uh, change gears and talk a little bit about lay foam and poralay materials. These are, these are my absolute favorite materials. They're commercially available, and you can order them from various... Um, uh, filament providers for 3D printing. And, and these materials are very, very interesting because when you print them, they print solid, uh, but they're, 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 they're composite or blended materials. They're, they're polyurethanes, thermoplastic polyurethanes, blended with, with uh, polyvinyl alcohol. So polyvinyl alcohol, you can imagine it's like that material that you put around like a fish feeding bag and you put it in water and it dissolves and then lets the food out slowly over time. So that material, when you put these prints in water and wash them uh, for a few days, the polyvinyl alcohol comes out and it leaves behind a porous network, a nanoporous network. So we can't really see the open pores on here because they're too small, but you can see what happens to the filament. It goes from becoming very smooth to becoming striated. And this is LAFOM, which we published a lot on. And we're working now with a new material called LAFELT. Well, it's a, it's a new material for us. It's not a new material. And you can see that it makes this really, really uh, stringy porous network, which really looks to me a lot like collagen fibers, although it's a lot larger than collagen fibers. So these are some nice SCMs that were, were just done by a uh, postdoc in our lab, Meg Cook. Uh, and, and we're moving forward with these. So I just wanted to introduce these materials to you and tell you what we've done with, with a little bit with LAFOM. So the LAFOM material, We've had several papers uh, over the past three years where we showed that this is a great material for loading and releasing drugs. And it's just a purely uh, uh, diffusion-based uh, system. So you can load it with a, a desired amount of drug, and then you can easily monitor uh, using various methods how much drug comes out over time. So we've shown that we can load this with doxorubicin and effectively deliver uh, the doxorubicin in a, in a sustained release uh, manner and, and block uh, 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 these spine meth cells from growing. And these ones were, in this case, were secondary to prostate cancer. Uh, we also showed that we can load them with the bisphosphonate zolodronate and, and release them in a sustained manner as well to, to block uh, uh, cancer growth. Uh, we've also used them to compare to other types of thermoplastics to look for their elastic properties because we're interested in, in, in like I said, we're also interested in ligament and tendon repair. Uh, and we're able to uh, place this in context of, of uh, actual uh, ligament mechanics, which it's quite a bit softer than, than ligament, but we have an idea here to co-print these in various ways with various materials to strengthen them and, and allow fl some flexibility. Uh, and, and finally, we've also shown that that uh, nanoporous material can actually be used to promote bone repair in a mandible defect in, in a rat. Uh, so they're, 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 they're able to grow osteoblasts in vitro, they're able to promote uh, matrix deposition of those osteoblasts in vitro, and they're actually able to prepare some, uh, to promote some uh, bone repair in vivo as well in, in a mandible defect. So I, I think this material is fantastic. Uh, and, and just switching gears a little bit more to, to show you some, some things we've been doing recently with this uh, material is we're, we're generating different types of scaffolds. Uh, in, in collaboration with Julie Fredet at, at Laval and uh, Sophie LaRouge at, uh, at uh, Ecole Technologie Supérieure uh, to combine those scaffolds with hydrogels 
and uh, ACL fibroblasts, as well as adipose-derived stem cells in an effort to use, uh, to show that we can use um, uh, vascular stromal fractions for tissue repair. And, and why are vascular stromal fractions important? Uh, because liposuction can be done rapidly in the operating room during a procedure, and within one and a half to two hours, you can isolate a uh, stem cell enriched population of cells. So there's a there's a possibility to use vascular stromal fraction in one in one surgical procedure to be performed. So there there's there that's the advantage of it. So we're, we're using this uh, in combination with uh, ACL fibroblasts just to show that this tissue that the, that these tissue cell sources can be uh, compatible with those LAFOM scaffolds as well as uh, different types of hydrogels. Uh, so so these uh, this work was done by uh, Jean Gabriel Lacombe a master student in the lab, and he's showing the, the, the cytocompatibility of primary human ACL fibroblasts that we get in collaboration with Paul Martineau, a surgeon here in, in, in orthopedic surgery. And he was able to uh, ask the question, do we need to do anything to those lay foam scaffolds? Do we need to coat them with anything to enhance cell adhesion and growth? Um, and you can see under all these different conditions with different uh, protein coatings, it didn't make a difference. The cells are quite viable. Um, and again, the, we did some PCR just to show that there, that these ACL fibroblasts under all those conditions actually retain their, their, their uh, phenotypes. So sclerexis is a major, uh, transcription factor for tendon and ligament cells and call three, uh, again, is another, uh, protein that should be activated highly in those cells and they retain their phenotype. Uh, uh, what we did find is that the lay foam by itself is perfect for, uh, allowing cell adhesion. We didn't really need to coat it with anything. They, they adhere uh, just fine without any coatings. Um, again, the, the viability uh, over time as, as uh, measured by metabolic activity remains stable under all these conditions and the cell growth remains constant under all these conditions. So we really don't need to coat it with anything. We can already get optimal uh, cell adhesion and growth without any coatings. Uh, finally, um, uh, Gabe did some measurements. He did some protein extractions from these scaffolds that he grew for, for 21 days and was able to show that there's a nice uh, uh, call one to call three ratio uh, because uh, I don't know if many of you know that, but ligament and, and tendons uh, tissues are mainly collagen type one and, and the second main type of collagen is collagen type three. So he was able to show that they're retaining their phenotype again and producing matrix on top of those scaffolds. Uh, but, you know, th this seminar series is really about translation. And so uh, what can we do? How can we translate these scaffolds for clinical applications? And what are the ideas here? Well, we think that we can generate these scaffolds. We think that we, because they're slightly less mechanically compliant, we can make them as a coprint with, with two polymer types that would strengthen them. And we can we believe that we could also use bioprinting and biofabrication applications to combine hydrogels and cells with this to allow them to grow in a more native-like environment. We think we can use two different approaches, either an in vivo uh, mature maturation approach or an in vitro uh, maturation approach. Uh, and we have a new student working on this. And these are vascular stromal fraction uh, cell populations that we've been getting in collaboration uh, with Josh uh, Borsten. Borstenbosch from uh, uh, the Department of Plastic Surgery, who's getting us adipose samples. And again, like I said, we also collaborate with uh, Julie Fredette at ULaval, who's an adipose stem cell expert. Uh, and what we're showing right now is that using uh, different types of chitosan hydrogels, we can keep these populations alive for several days so far. Uh, and the student is now working towards uh, using differentiation protocols to see if we can differentiate those uh, adipose-derived stem cells into uh, tendon ligament type cells. So that's ongoing work. And we think that these scaffolds could be used as an implantable, uh, much similar to the, the, the surgical technique called the bear technique, uh, which basically is being used in the US, which is a collagen sponge that's attached to ACL tears and allows the regeneration of the ACL tissue without having to do allografts or autografts. So we think we can use this in that way. Other things that we think we can do to translate this type of work is by combining uh, that, that TCP uh, lactide material that I was telling you about, that 100M beta TCP, by co-printing it with the LAFOM core. 
And what's interesting about this approach is we can have something that promotes bone repair in the in the in this mechanically uh, competent material that has beta TCP, and we believe we can fill it with um, uh, different types of therapeutics like anti-cancer drugs. So we know that we can get from these little scaffolds. We know that we can load them with doxorubicin. We know that we can measure doxorubicin coming out. And we know that if we put these in a dish with, uh, for example, some breast cancer cells, that it, it releases a significant amount of drug to actually inhibit uh, the uh, cancer cell growth to the same degree as though just treating it directly with the drug. So this is a good delivery device. Um, and we're working now on uh, the in vivo portion of this, where we're actually implanting uh, a tumor, uh, patient-derived tumor cells into the caudal vertebrae, which is a, an extension of the spine. So we're calling this sort of like a pseudo spine model. And, and what we're doing is we're allowing the tumors to grow for a few weeks and then resecting the tumors and then filling them with this scaffold and, and uh, the, this, this composite scaffold loaded with uh, doxorubicin to see if we can block recurrence of cancer because there will be some residual tumor cells there. And if we can actually promote uh, the bone to uh, repair based on that uh, bioactive properties of the material. So that's where some, some areas where we think this can be translated. Okay, so I'm going to move away from that now and talk a little bit more about what we're doing with bioprinting. Uh, and the main thing, like I said before, what we're using bioprinting for uh, is to generate uh, the bone tumor microenvironment. And why is that interesting to us? Because like I told you, those patients uh, all have different types of cancers. And even if, they're, if, even if their metastases are from the same primary source like breast or prostate, uh, the subtypes of tumor cells that are, that are present are quite heterogeneous and can have different responses to drugs. So having a model system in which to screen therapeutics uh, would be a, a major advantage for, for these surgical oncologists. Okay, so the things that we're working on is developing bioinks for these tumor microenvironment models. So the main person in the lab working on this is, is our postdoc, Megan Cook. Uh, and what we're doing is we're optimizing bioinks to support that bone-like environment. Uh, we're introducing those tumor cells into the central core of those, of those models that we're building. And we want to assess the formation of these multicellular spheroids and whether we can inhibit them with different types of treatment regimes and then we want to validate the migration of the cancer cells into the healthy region that we promote around. So what that essentially does is we're bioprinting a stroma that has either cancer associated fibroblasts or osteoblasts uh, isolated from the bone of those patients and then populating the central core with actual uh, patient derived tumor. And over time, we're looking at whether those tumor cells are growing out into the microenvironment and, and how dense the, these multicellular spheroids are growing within the middle. So, so what uh, Megan has done over the last uh, year and a half is she's done all of the rheology on our bioink that we're using. And, and this bioink uh, was, was suggested to us through collaboration with Matt Kinsella over in bioengineering at McGill. And, and basically what we've done is we've taken a formulation of alginate and gelatin and we've uh, modified it by adding 0.5% nanohydroxyapatite, which Megan makes here in the lab herself. So what that does is it creates a bioink uh, that has a bioactive component to it. And hydroxyapatite, again, is another type of bone mineral, uh, which could help promote either osteoblasts or stem cells or fibroblasts to, to maintain that uh, bone-like microenvironment uh, in the form of uh, bone-like matrix deposition. So what she's done is she's tested uh, rheologically all the properties of these hydrogels specifically for their ability to be printed in an extrusion bioprinter. Uh, and she's gone ahead and shown that they have a very quick recovery after printing. So she, she's, she's printing, this is the rheology where she's done a quick, uh, uh, the dropping of the temperature, the ramping of the pressure, and she gets a quick recovery as the temperature uh, is, is coming back. And what, what happens and why is it important to understand these, these parameters when you're doing the bioprinting is if you don't have your parameters set properly, for example, when, when it's too warm on the print bed, you get a lot of oozing of your, of your sample and, and they kind of, you don't get these open pore networks that you want and you want those open pore networks to get culture media there to keep a nutrient to all of your cells. So what ends up happening is these all ooze together, but if you really nail your print parameters, in this case, we had to test this on different uh, cooling bed temperatures, 
you can see that the print fidelity is really held nicely. So she's done a really nice job here showing uh, the importance of the print parameters for this material with the uh, hydroxyapatite in it. Okay, we should did some SCM here to also show you that when you don't have hydroxyapatite in this material, it's very smooth. You don't see any rough surface, but when you add the hydroxyapatite uh, by SEM here, you can see the very rough surface from the nano uh, or the microparticles, nanoparticles. Uh, and then here you see it with some uh, osteoblast cells sitting inside uh, the, the samples here. So it's, the system is working really nicely. Um, and what she's shown is after 28 days, you can go from very small individual cells to these rather large multicellular spheroids. Uh, and when you add different amounts of doxorubicin, you can block those multicellular spheroids from forming. So you here essentially have no multicellular spheroids, uh, but under these conditions, you can see that there's quite a lot of multicellular spheroids. Okay, so what, what she's working on now is finalizing this model. And in this case, it's just uh, IRM90 fibroblasts on the outside and GFP labeled uh, breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer cell line in the middle. And you can see that on day zero, you don't, all of the breast cancer cells are in the center, uh, but by day, day 28, those breast cancer cells really migrated out into the periphery of that uh, stromal compartment. Um, so she can quantify this uh, by looking at the number of GFP positive cells that went out into the periphery, and, and she can quantify how far they go and over what time course they went. So as you can see here, this is just a, this is just a, the, the breast, breast cancer cell outgrowth. As you increase the amount of uh, doxorubicin in the system, you greatly diminish the amount of outgrowth and you also start to kill off the, the tumor core. So she's working now on using patient-derived tumor cells. So these are spine metastasis cells secondary to breast, lung, uh, and prostate cancer that she's working with. And she's putting this with primary human spine osteoblasts uh, that are derived from spine samples uh, in the periphery and then measuring uh, the rate at which uh, they outgrow and at which concentration of drug can that be blocked. So this is how the model looks conceptually. We put the, the core on the outside. We typically have a, a, another layer of gel that, that is empty of any cells and then the central core that has tumor. The idea would be how can we use this for testing our, our, our therapeutics and things like that, well, we can either look at just the outgrowth or we can actually perform little resections by using a biopsy puncher. We can remove that core and then put in uh, like 3D printed constructs or which I'll talk about in a second, uh, cements that we're working on to look at drug release and, and effect on migration of tumor cells out and uh, multicellular spheroid formation. Uh, so uh, another, another uh, person that I'm collaborating with collaborating with is uh, Stefan Roder over at uh, TransMedTech, Institute TransMedTech uh, at, at uh, Ecole Polytechnique, uh, who is working on plasma medicine. So we had we just received some funding from the New Frontiers and Research Fund to use this exact bone microenvironment tumor model or uh, just the bone microenvironment model for either uh, for studying bone infections as well. So plasma medicine is, is a hot topic for uh, its ability to induce reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. And, and that can uh, impact or highly impact uh, highly proliferating cells such as bacteria or tumor cells. So the idea is to develop a, a portable uh, system uh, for applying this uh, intraoperatively. And we can use our model, which is a, which is a humanized tissue model, to test whether this can block tumor cell uh, outgrowth, uh, tumor spheroid formation, as well as block uh, infection from different uh, sources in collaboration with uh, Dow Nguyen over at, uh, over at Microbiology and Immunology. And we get all of our uh, bone samples from uh, Mike Weber, another surgeon here in orthopedic surgery. So this model's uh, being uh, now exploited for a lot of these uh, different uh, types of analyses that we wanna do. And we think it holds a lot of promise for screening therapies such as new and novel uh, anti-cancer therapies, new uh, therapies to promote bone formation, and new therapies such as cold, uh, cold plasma therapies that could be useful for uh, blocking uh, bone cancer uh, growth as well as uh, bone infections. 
Uh, some other things that we're doing, uh, that I'm doing in collaboration with uh, TransMedTech projects, as well as the uh, uh, MAE project and, and a company, Saguaro Technologies. This is in collaboration with um, uh, Abdella Aji and, and Michel Wertheimer at uh, Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, we're working on commercializing uh, a system to uh, interface tumor and tissue subtypes using electrospun mats that are treated uh, surface activated uh, with different types of plasmas. And we're looking at uh, this as a screening tool, a high throughput screening tool that we're working with Saguaro Technologies to commercialize. And that project is actually quite promising as well. So just to give a quick uh, conclusion on, on the main types of things we're doing is we're, we're really taking advantage of these low cost uh, thermoplastic 3D printers and resorbable polymers for tissue repair and regeneration applications, as well as using them for local drug delivery devices. Um, there is room here for personalization, right? So we can make personalized constructs that fit perfectly to a bony defect. Uh, we can make uh, personalized medications for people suffering from different types of disease. We can tune those biophysical and chemical components to optimize the mechanical properties and tissue integration. Uh, and our bioprinting platform really can be used to model tissue interfaces such as the tumor microenvironment or the, the, the bone infection microenvironment, which we're actively working on. Uh, and by incorporating these patient-derived samples, uh, there is potential for therapeutic screening, drug discovery, repurposing, and personalized medicine. So just before we, we finish off, I'll give you a few other things that we're working on. We're also working on nanoparticles, and I see we're, we're almost running short on time and I want to leave room for questions. Uh, we're working on nanoparticles. Uh, these are silica, mesoporous silica nanoparticles for drug uptake and delivery as well. Uh, and the reason we're working with these is to work with polymethyl methacrylate cements. So these are the standard go-to uh, materials for uh, closing up uh, large bony defects in the spine. So uh, we have a plan to functionalize those uh, those materials to actually deliver therapy locally. Like I said, systemic chemotherapy doesn't really get to those sites in the spine that well. So this could be another way to get a uh, drug directly to the site where it's needed. So a master student in the group is now working on that. He's, he's mixing different types of uh, uh, nanoparticles, silica nanoparticles here. You can see 2%, uh, 8%, and you can see in the, in the cement, this is pretty smooth, the cement, when you look up close to it here, it's uh, got a lot of roughness on it, which are the nanoparticles, and we can actively uh, measure the doxorubicin release over time from that. Uh, and, and he's able to show that if you put those little cement pods, these tiny little uh, three millimeter cement pods on either breast cancer cells or prostate cancer cell lines, it's uh, releasing enough over a short period of time, four to seven days, to really uh, block all the growth of those tumor cells. So that, that's looking promising as well. Um, and other things that we're using bioprinting for uh, is, is modeling that osteochondral interface that I mentioned to you. Uh, and this is just preliminary data. We haven't gotten very far in this project, but we're, we're quite interested and eager to get this project going with collaborators over at the Shriners Hospital. We're interested in modeling um, uh, osteochondritis desiccans, which affects quite a lot of children where the, where the, the cartilage and subchondral bone sort of peels away in their knee or elbow causing them pain and locking motion so they can't run and, and have a normal uh, athletic childhood. So we're trying to model this. And what we can do is we can take that hydroxyapatite hydrogel, load it with osteoblasts. We can take the uh, chondros, like uh, primary human chondrocytes and put them uh, in, in, the other, in the other layer. And we can, we can keep these alive for up to 28 days. We can measure protein content. So we're interested, again, using this as a, a therapeutic screening model. So I'd just like to show uh, the group here. So uh, Audrey and Atik are both working on 3D printed constructs and nanoparticle constructs for, for spine mets treatment. Uh, Gargi is the new student working on uh, uh, the vascular stromal fractions, adipose derived stem cells uh, for uh, ligament uh, repair. Uh, Megan is the postdoc in the group and she's working on the bioprinting uh, and she pretty much runs a lot of things in the lab, a lot of projects. Uh, there's uh, Hairi, is a student that I co-supervise with Shoan Nazat over in uh, mechanical engineering, uh, mining materials engineering at McGill. And she's working also on ligament repair and regeneration in, in collagen hydrogels. 
uh, Eliane is a master's student working on uh, bone metastasis models and the effects of senescence and, and uh, anti-senescent drugs on those models. Mansoure and Neda are two PhD students uh, that I co-supervise from Eco Polytechnic with Abdel Aji. And they're working, uh, Neda is working on microfluidics devices for tumor spheroid formation and uh, drug screening. And Mansoure is working on that, uh, that patent project that we have with TransMedTech for the, the tumor tissue interface model. Um, Lily is a summer student this summer working on bioprinting ligament samples uh, with ACL fibroblasts. Uh, this is Oriane. She, is, she was a, a student that we had. She just went back to France. We had her for six months uh, doing uh, her master's internship with us. And she was working on uh, bioactive glass in bioprinted models to look at its effect on uh, attracting migration of fibroblasts and osteoblasts to a collagen scaffold. And uh, Jean-Gabriel is a master's student that just finished up and he was working a lot with LAFOM, uh, LAFOM 3D printing uh, uh, for ACL tissue repair and regeneration. So with that, I thank all the lab members, all the past lab members, all our funding sources, and all of my collaborators, which is a huge list here to go through. Uh, so with that, I will stop and take any questions from the audience. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Rosenzweig, uh, for this great talk. And uh, you have uh, lots of active research uh, going on in your, an active collaboration uh, going on in your, uh, your team. And congratulations to the team that uh, we always hear good news on the social media from your group uh, publishing, uh, you know, receiving grants and other stuff. So before going, you know, I just want to give you some time to take a breath uh, and I announce the next seminar, uh, sure. seminar, and then we go to the questions from the audience. Uh, next uh, Wednesday at <clears throat> noon uh, Eastern time, same time, we have uh, Professor Mehdi Nikha from Arizona State University that is talking about tissue and chip technologies, building better models to study human diseases. Uh, please uh, 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 follow us on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn to get the most updated information uh, for the uh, upcoming seminar series. So we do have a couple of questions from the audience uh, in, the, in the question box. Uh, Muhammad is asking about scaffolds uh, that you, you talked about different scaffolds and he's wondering if you're, you're selecting these scaffolds on the basis of uh, the application sites in terms of properties and characteristics. Yeah, so, so maybe he wants to uh, clarify a little bit more. Um, so, so in terms of which scaffolds, because we, we make a lot of scaffolds. So, so is he specifically talking about like uh, thermoplastic scaffolds and, and things like this? Or is he talking about uh, uh, other scaffolds that we use for just growing cells in either in suspension or interfaces? For sure, Muhammad, if uh, you can clarify which scaffold are you talking about? Uh, so uh, uh, Professor uh, Rosenzweig can, uh, uh, can explain more. And, and uh, Walla, Walla, Walla. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, Olam, I think is... Uh, one of the PhD students in uh, materials or chemical engineering at McGill, and he's working. He has he's uh, uh, actually sending greetings to you. That oh, uh, had Jelani. A pleasure. Well, yes. Jelani, yeah. There's and Jelani. A pleasure okay. to work with you during his PhD. Yeah, and uh, he's uh, actually like excited to see all these results and progress that you're making in the lab. Thank yeah. you, Jelani. Thank you for the comments. I miss you, Jelani. We haven't seen you in so long. Yeah, uh, Jelani, exactly. Jelani did some excellent work while he was here uh, with with uh, nanoparticles and uh, drug delivery devices. Uh, so he was working with Marta Saruti at that Marta, time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So so he he was uh, doing a wonderful job when he was here. Exactly. So my <clears throat> so I have also a couple of questions. The first one that I uh, the first question I have is about you're talking about these scaffolds for drug screening application. And uh, you talk about in the schematic, you show us uh, like a disc uh, with a certain thickness. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you have a thick uh, 
you know, take a, a platform or sample, how would you make sure that the the core is kind of you know getting the oxygen nutrients without any vascularization? This this is an excellent question. So the the usually when we make scaffolds like that, we try to build in pores that have uh, a certain distance from each other. So we try to use the the minimum criteria from. For example, the thermoplastic printer, you your struts, you can't usually make your struts smaller than between 500 to 700 micron, depending on the nozzle size that you use, just based on the physics of how it prints. Um, so, so we're trying to use that as our guide. So typically we have 700 micron to 500 micron struts between those open pores. And we didn't do the analysis in vivo for um f- for the vasculature inside there uh which is a which is a great question and we should go back and do that with follow-up studies um but m- my gut feeling is telling me that it's enough to allow for nutrient uh, diffusion there's a rule of thumb right like 100 micron thickness One. or 200 One. micron thickness there's a rule of thumb so some of our gels we actually make them quite when we when we bioprint gels, but they're they're highly uh, hydrated and porous. So there's and on top of that, the types of cells that we usually put in there don't necessarily demand a high uh, a high nutrient content. For example, if we use chondrocytes or ligament fibroblasts, which we've been doing a lot of lately, they're they're coming from mostly avascular tissue. So they are relying just on they they usually rely on fluid convection to get uh, an exchange of uh, waste for new glucose coming in from the from the fluid uh, so it seems to be working okay we get a high viability so it could be just that we're using s- s- uh, low low concentration alginate gelatin it's allowing for the media and, and nutrient to diffuse through readily so we've made some quite thick ones that are quite viable but we didn't do how, all how of that, thick, that may analysis I ask, how thick, may i ask how thick uh, is the sample some of them are going up to uh, 600 microns. So we do three layers of 200 for some of those modelings, and they seem to be okay. Now, again, when we make those, we often uh, have an open pore network as well. So media is going all the way through those pores and sitting all inside. So it's coming from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Uh, It seems to be okay for viability. It doesn't seem to be disrupting viability. That's great. And uh, a a follow-up question about if you have any plan or follow-up study to kind of um, see the effect of perfusion or shear stress or this kind of things on your tissue model? We, we haven't gotten into any of that, but I'm sure that Neda has thought about this, especially with her microfluidic devices, because mm-hmm. uh, loading them and unloading them generates a lot of shear fluid uh, stress on the cells and, and spheroids that she generates. So possibly that's something that we could do. But of course, I I don't have much expertise in this area. We would have to collaborate with somebody uh, for doing that. But it's a a good point. And and just using the models, even the uh, thin tissue models that we generate and applying uh, fluid shear over them would be a very good idea. Exactly. And I think uh, Ghulam Jalani also had a follow-up question about uh, if... He's wondering if you considered using any nanoparticles embedded hydrogel uh, with trigger drug release for cancer treatment in, in any other projects that okay. you have. So, so, so say it again. Hydro- like, uh, do you have you ever embedded nanoparticles inside the hydrogel or bio inks uh, for triggering drug release uh, for cancer treatment? We haven't done this yet. So that's something that... Um, that uh, Atik will do with his cement pods, but not just dispersing the the nanoparticles into the gel. He's keeping them in a cement to simulate what would happen in you know in the patient if you put a block of cement that has the nanoparticle in it. Mm-hmm. So the, it, it's a it's a question that we one master student was supposed to do, but he he was a surgical resident, so he didn't have time to get into it by just injecting nanoparticles into the gel. Uh, but we didn't get to it. 
That's great. Uh, another question from the audience is that if you add a chemotherapy agent, uh, for example, doxorubicin, to a material that would serve as a bone replacement regenerating material, how does the chemotherapy agent affect osteoblast viability and osteogenesis? This is from uh, Professor Marek from uh, Poland. Okay, uh, so, so th that's a very good question. So, and this is the exact type of things that uh, uh, former PhD student, he, he went to residency, but he has to come back to finish his PhD work, uh, uh, is working on. So he's building the, he, he's, test, he's testing different types of stroma primary human osteoblasts in the bioprinted model, and primary uh, human bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells. So he's got two types of stroma that he's testing, and he's putting his drug delivery device into the middle of that, and then he puts tumor cells in that core. So he's actually measuring the viability of the tumor cells versus the surrounding stroma over time with the drug release. So from the preliminary data, I can tell you that it looks like it doesn't really affect the mesenchymal stem cells that much in terms of viability. In terms of differentiation, we didn't do the experiment. We have to do it. So we have to test the effect on the ability of those stem cells to continue to differentiate. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is that, uh, did you work on how nanoparticles are moved or navigated toward cancer cells? So the, the way that we've been working with the nanoparticles is not free form. So we've been we've been embedding them in cements or or um, we've been embedding them in other types of matrices so that they're not moving at all. Uh, they're, they're static. And that would be the purpose for them to be static is to apply them directly to a site that they're needed, and then they do not get dispersed anywhere. They stay right where they're needed until they've offloaded all of the drug. Mm -hmm. So we didn't work with free flow, with free form nanoparticles that can actually move around. We haven't done any of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think Mohammed uh, clarified his question. Okay. Are all scaffolds are biodegradable, for example, for uh, bone regeneration? Uh, you can directly print it, but for soft tissue, you will be using biodegradable scaffold. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, so I understand better what he's asking. Okay, so uh, theoretically, you could make any type of polymer to, you know, to custom-made polymer for biodegradation, and you can tune the polymer to degrade at certain rates, depending on how you make it, whether it's a blend, a composite. Um, so the, scaff the, the scaffolds we're working with will actually take quite a long time to, to degrade. They'll take like at least, the, the ones from the company, I think, I don't remember exactly, but it's at least one year to degrade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's by hydrolysis. And then we would have to do long-term in vivo study to look at the effect of you know body fluids and things like that. Uh, cell proteins, things like that. The scaffolds for ligament repair and regeneration that we're working on, those commercial scaffolds are actually not made from biodegradable uh, polyurethanes. They're, they're made from the non-biodegradable polyurethanes. But what we found from the preliminary in vivo work is they are degraded. So mm -hmm. the, the question remains over time, is, are, are those degradation product, products uh, having a harmful effect or not? But as, as, as you guys probably know, you can get biodegradable polyurethane as well. So, so the, the, to, in order to have that as a translatable uh, device, we would probably want to tune it to be biodegradable and in some kind of time scale that allows for proper tissue repair before that scaffold is gone. So that, that's like the, the holy grail of tissue engineering, right? You have a scaffold that as the body is regenerating the tissue on the scaffold, the scaffold is degrading. In, in some sort of matching time frame, while maintaining the mechanical integrity, so so those those are all things that we will be working towards. But at the moment, that scaffold is not biodegradable. Thank you so much. In terms of translation, you talked about and commercialization. You talked about this <clears throat> electrospun uh, plasma polymerized activated uh, surfaces or mats that uh, you use for uh, modeling the cancer. Uh, I'm just wondering, 
what would be the final product? Uh, is it going to be the service space? Is it going to, are you selling these uh, like tissues uh, in, in the Petri dish and in the uh, uh, well plates uh, to, to the end users, pharmaceutical companies? And a follow-up question about the sterilization procedure that you're following uh, uh, for to, to sterilize these samples. Mm -hmm. Yes, so very good question, and you probably know quite a bit about those projects since you, you yourself were working on them uh, a few years back. So, so um, yeah, it, it, so the idea is to have a, like a plate, a multi-well plate kit. Mm -hmm. So imagine you have a, a 96 well plate or a 384 well plate that has the mat already in the bottom with the surface coating desired could be there are multiple surface coatings, but this one has the one you chose for fibroblast, best for fibroblast adhesion, or best for osteoblast adhesion, or best for you know nerve cell adhesion, wh whatever you can think of. Uh, so the idea is you have this plate, and because of the way you've set this plate, it's not only is it a 3D culture, but it's uh, mechanically competent. It could be po like flexible polyurethane, it could be polylactic acid. You can adjust the porosity for the mechanical properties. Uh, fiber size, as you know, all of these things can be custom made for the end user, or we can have generic plates that are just available for, for sale. This would come with component B, which is a lyophilized gel system, which you reconstitute with, you know, solution A, uh, reconstitute it, add your cells to solution A and gel while you, while you, while you put your, whatever your target tissue cell is, if it's an osteoblast, it's a fibroblast, you let those sit on the mesh, you put them in the incubator for 30 minutes. While that's cooking, you reconstitute your gel and your cancer cell of interest. And there may be different gel types depending on which cancer cell type you wanna grow. You take the, this, this uh, plate from the incubator now that has all of your fibroblasts, your osteoblasts on it, and you apply the, the tumor on top. Use, use solution B to cross-link and uh, you're ready to go. You're ready to put this, let it, let it stabilize overnight in the incubator and then do your drug screen over seven days and, and do, your, do your metabolic activity assay, whatever you plan to do in the plate reader. And it's, uh, it, it's gonna enhance uh, this tumor tissue interface. Uh, it's gonna make it more physiological and it's going to make it uh, less expensive in the end because it's not reliant on matrigels and all these other things. And in terms of a sterilization method? So for, for the moment, we are sterilizing things, you know, by hand in, in the in the lab, just in the R&D phase. But the idea would be at some point to get this thing, you know, gamma irradiated and, and uh, at, a, at, a, at a higher level in, in manufacturing. So that would be the idea. And that's what the company that we work with is, is actually coming with solutions for. Okay. That's a very good uh, technology and uh, it's really needed uh, for end users like pharmaceutical companies and also R&D research labs. But uh, since I'm also thinking about the, the, the similar projects sometimes, you know, like you talked about PLA, PU and other things, that, you know, like fibrous structure, electrospun fibers. These are kind of like the material, synthetic material that they have relatively high mechanical properties. So in terms of like native uh, tumor tissue, um, most of the time, I think we have here kind of excessive mechanical property by using this kind of uh, mm -hmm. matrices. I don't know how, how would you address this, uh, these challenges, you know, uh, once you use them for, for bone regeneration, it makes sense for bone uh, tumors, but for breast cancers or any other melanoma or other, other tissue, other uh, tumors, uh, how do you, how do you tackle this? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've hit the point right on. So the, the reason obviously why we chose to go with this bone interface is because that is my direct interest. And I was able to leverage this with our partnership with uh, TransMedTech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but we have discussed this. So, so the, the simplest answer to your question could be electrospinning collagen fibers or electrospinning mm -hmm. gelatin fibers or 
other materials that could be just as soft, but providing uh, an actual matrix like network mm -hmm. for the initial cell adhesion. Another solution that we've talked about would be gel on gel, just like the same gel we're working with, but component one, component two mm -hmm. would be another, would another way. And as you know, all of these gels can be tuned pretty easily for, for increasing or decreasing mechanical strength. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that would be that that's the general idea, but the fine details of that, obviously, um, that's what, uh, you know, Abdella yeah, is working. Yeah, he's he's working on that for a long time and he's working on that. Also discussing that with the with the company as well. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Drake. Uh, I want to pass to Mohsen because sometimes he has many questions. I don't know. To do <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, very interesting talk, uh, uh, very inspiring, uh, and I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed your uh, your presentation. So, uh, my question is uh, uh, about your drug uh, eluting uh, uh, scaffolds for delivering uh, anti cancer drugs to bone defect. So, so, uh, and uh, I was struggling with my laptop when we were. You were talking about that part, so forgive me if I, uh, if, if if you already talked about this. So, my impression is that, uh, or my understanding is that you, three D print these drug eluting, uh, you know, scaffolds, and then the plan is to implant them in the bone defect post surgery. Is that correct? It, during surgery. During surgery, look yes. after the tumor is removed. Yes. Okay. Uh, so now, now my question is. Uh, about uh, the rationale for using 3D printing instead of, for example, uh, using these injectable cements into the defect. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you can comment on that, uh, that would be that would be. Yes. Good. So so there's two two schools of thought. Mm -hmm. One would be regulatory types of schools of thought. So from a regulatory standpoint it would be much easier and less boundaries to have a functionalized cement for this application, particularly an approved commercial cement with an approved drug, with an approved nanoparticle that's inert. So, so that's one avenue that we go by because we think this is a clear, clear path to, um, to uh, translation. The other pathway is the 3D printing so the problem with the acrylic cements, as, as you may or may not know, is they don't promote bone repair and regeneration. And the problem that happens to those patients that get the bone cement injected into the, or even if it's percutaneous or however it's done, but it's injected by like a kyphoplasty method or whether it was actually open surgery and packed in, what ends up happening to a lot of the patients is because of the advances in, in you know, surgical oncology, the patients actually live quite a long time. So some of them are on palliative care, but some of them actually go home and they live for, for quite a while. And the, those tumors undetected grow back and destabilize the cement. There was no bone repair in that area. You just have a block of cement. And if that becomes destabilized, they, they have to come back. They come back to the operating room with pinched nerve and they can't, they, they're paralyzed or in immense pain and they have to be seen again. Not for all the patients, but this is my understanding from the clinicians. So it's a problem still. Uh, so how do we get around that problem? Well, we thought that we could take advantage of those 3D printed polymers that could promote bone repair, specifically the ones that were resorbable and having the, the ceramic component to it. So we, we were pushing it a lot in our studies, and we think that the data indicates this would be a good tool. Add to that the personalization. So if the surgeon has a CT scan from the patient, they usually know exactly where the tumor is that they're going to operate on. So we have more or less an idea of what the surgical site is going to look like. This could, in theory, be uh, reverse engineered to an actual custom implant. Again, it depends on whether that patient comes in in the emergency or not. Sometimes, you know, A lot of times they come in in an emergency and there wouldn't be time to do anything like that. So, but our, the, end, the end goal and rationale would be that, okay, we have two streams. We have a functionalized cement for the, for the uh, emergency cases, 
And for the non-emergency cases, for the elective surgeries, maybe we could go this route, which would end up being better for the patient in the long term. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Uh, so my other question is around the same uh, topic, it's, uh, and it's uh, about the dose of drug that you choose. Uh, so how much, ha ha so in terms of translational uh, application of these uh, 3D printed uh, uh, drug eluting scaffolds, or implants, uh, how do you determine the dose? Uh, as Because as, this is going to be a localized therapy kind of a, mm -hmm. um, approach, right? Uh, and then and, and then the dose should be comparable to, you know, uh, to, 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 to the doses uh, or to the, uh, you know, uh, to the drug concentrate, plasma concentrations of the drug mm -hmm. when they are administered uh, systematic, systemically. Uh, so can you comment on, on uh, the way or, or uh, you know, uh, on ways you uh, calculate the amount of drug that you put in these, uh, in these uh, implants? Sure. So it, it's, it's quite difficult to calculate exactly what the local uh, amount of drug would be after uh, a systemic uh, systemic uh, delivery. Even, you know, I, I, I'm a pharmacologist in background. I can tell you even it's, it's not so simple to calculate what's going to be at the site that you want it when you give a mm -hmm. systemic delivery. Um, but that being said, we don't try to compare it necessarily to what the, the actual systemic delivery dose is for the patient because it doesn't really matter to us. What matters to us is are we getting a high enough dose that supersedes the, the IC or EC50 or whatever we're, we're aiming for. Here. Okay, so how do we do that? We do a whole series of in vitro 2D uh, dose response curves for our cell lines that we work with, as well as the patient derived cells that we work with. So once we get that dose response curve, we know exactly what dose we need in that two mLs of media or whatever is in the dish to kill more than 50% of the cancer cells. So that's what we're going for. We're trying to get an elution over seven days, somewhere in the midpoint that reaches the micromolar or nanomolar amount of the drug, depending on which drug we're using, whether it's cisplatin or, or doxorubicin. We're trying to get that concentration eluted from our scaffold in that four to seven day range that would model what we're dumping into the dish to generate the IC50. Mm -hmm. After we do that, we do the same series of experiments in a 3D culture, then we make it more complex by adding a 3D co-culture and so on and so forth. Then we have to go backwards and test it in vivo in the animal. Okay. okay. So, so it's not so much about matching it to what the patient gets. It's about generating a local concentration that's high enough to supersede that IC50. Mm -hmm. And we don't, do want have to go, we don't want to go over that because then it becomes toxic to the, to the surrounding tissue. But uh, do you have any concerns regarding the translation of the results or the doses that you you get from 2D uh, or in vitro models to into humans? It, it, yes, 100%. So that's why that's exactly why we, we're doing it in this stepwise manner. Where we go from yeah. 2D to a 3D culture to a 3D co-culture. And then finally, we have to do it in the animal to see that it's working in the same way and not causing the adverse effect. So there, there is a concern, but that's why we do it in this way. Thank you. I have no more questions. Great talk. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Razand Vaik, and uh, for your time and great presentation. <clears throat> and we had lots of questions uh, to ask. If uh, participants want to see the other uh, recordings from the previous uh, e-seminar, they can uh, most and shared it on the chat box. Uh, you can check our YouTube channel. And uh, if uh, if you have any question or comments, you can uh, always send us. And uh, don't forget to uh, log in next week uh, at the same time for Professor Nikha's uh, presentation from Arizona State University talking about tissue on chip uh, models. So uh, by that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Rosenzweig uh, uh, again, and uh, I'm Mohsen also in Europe uh, to join us late at night. <laughs>
and uh, wish you uh, all the best and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you again, guys, for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for your talk. Take care. Bye.